Okay, uh, thank you. I, I want to start by thanking you for sticking around to the very end. Uh, and I think we should also thank Horger and Christian for organizing this wonderful conference or the wonderful meeting at this wonderful place. All right. Um, so, uh, okay, so, uh, last time we ended, uh, with, uh, a criterion that was supposed, I mean, that implies the Farrow Jones conjecture and was formulated in terms of a sequence of maps to the classifying space we're interested in. And the condition, I mean, one of the conditions was that uh, this map is, when this, right, the X was compact. Uh, we didn't quite, we, we couldn't quite require that the map is G equivariant, but we sort of said it should almost be G equivariant. So the condition was uh, we have a sequence of maps that get more and more equivariant. Um, in this sense. Right, if I fix the group element, then the mistake we're making goes to zero as we take better and better maps f. But, but there is no limit of the f. There's no actual equivariant map. Okay, and then I, I tried to convince you that that's, uh, uh, not an easy thing to do. And maybe I went a little too far with this and convinced you that that's actually impossible. <laughs> right? I mean, so, uh, uh, I'm, the, the, the example we're really interested in, I think, are complicated. And I, I cannot give you an easy example. In particular, we want X to be compact, contractible. But let's do an easy example where, uh, we take as the group, again, the integers. And we take, uh, EG, aka EZ. Uh, but in this model, uh, actually we can do one here. So, sorry. All right, in this model I, uh, I briefly mentioned, um, yesterday. Ooh, sorry. Okay, and I'm not going to give you uh, a contractible set. I'm just going to give you a finite subset that if I move it by one, it just moves a tiny bit. Okay? Uh, and so we're going to draw um, I guess this was stupid. I will need to leave some space. Uh, so we, we draw the real line, the way we do, but then, uh, right, we can take another model where we also add lots of further one simplices. So, uh, like this, for example. Okay. So think of here as being zero and this is say minus n. And then the first point in my set, I'm just going to pick this vertex. Okay. And now if I want to, uh, I want it to be invariant under the action by plus one, then I'm tempted to also pick this vertex, right? But then if I keep going, I mean, I'll, I'll never, I'll never recover. So we'll uh, introduce a little lag by picking this vertex, okay? And then you can see the pattern. Then this vertex, right? If I move this vertex by one, it ends up here. So this is just a, a little bit away. And eventually, I'm going to add it n. So I'll have this here. Or well, let's do n minus 1 first. Uh, so n minus 1. Let me draw those uh, below then. Uh, it doesn't help. Um, Anyway, so right at n minus 1, we moved a tiny bit along this, so we ended up here. Okay, and then back at n, we're back here. 
Huh? So if I move, so if we move this set, you know, by if I apply the action of one, it just moves a little bit. Okay, and it shows us that it was really useful to have these uh, edges between vertices that are far apart. Okay, but it's of course not a not a contractual thing, so it doesn't tell us anything about about the Fair Jones conjecture. But it gives you some idea that it's not totally ridiculous to to hope for such a thing. Okay. Um. Okay, and then, then I want to uh, spend the rest of my time uh, discussing the easiest example of this, the easiest, I think, and that's the free group. So the free group is, of course, the fundamental group of a wedge of circles, and we're immediately, uh, immediately start to look at the action on its universal cover. Cover which is uh, the two n regular tree, so it's a wonderful metric space, right? So T is canonically a metric space. So we just use the pass length metric that gives every edge in T length one, and in particular, since it's a tree, we have unique geodesics. Right, between any two points of a geodesic, and it's unique. So it's, uh, it doesn't get much better than this. And of course, the action is also well, plays well with the uh, with the geometry. So it's an isometric action. Okay. Um, and then to build this compact space, we start by defining uh, the boundary of the tree. So a point on the boundary is an equivalence class of a geodesic ray. So C, C is supposed to be a geodesic ray. And we identify those uh, if we see the following picture. So a geodesic ray oh, might look like this. I mean, maybe it moves around in the tree, but why not draw it straight? Uh, and I might, might have another geodesic ray that starts somewhere else, but it's eventually C. So it could be, and then be the same ray, right? And then they're the same. Okay. And then we can think of adding the point Xi, which is the equivalence class of the ray, at the end of the ray C. And the end, of course, didn't depend on which equivalence class we took for race. Okay, so it makes perfect sense to add these points at infinity, and then uh, then we get a compactification of T, and it has all sorts of good properties. Right? It's compact, contractible. Okay, and just I mean, in case you haven't seen it. Um, uh, uh, let me just draw one example of a sequence that converges to a point. So it's not one thing, just the cantor The boundary? The boundary as a subset is a cantor set, right? Otherwise, it, yeah, I mean. Oh. Okay, let, let me, let me uh, keep talking and then we'll come back. Right, so I wanted to, to describe to you a sequence in in here that converges to a boundary point to give you a feeling for the topology. And what, what you could do is you, you pick, say, points x1, and we connect them to, say, the space point here by a geodesic. And then the condition is that if we do this, we hit the, the one geodesic towards xi later and later. Or we leave it later and later, starting from v0. Right? So this might be even here. Right, an, an infinite geodesic ray, so this point might be at the boundary, so this might be psi 3, might be on the boundary, and if I keep, keep going like this, 
right, then the xn converges to xi. And that's how we define a neighborhood of, of a point xi. We just pick the point v0, pick some point on the geodesic, and then ask for all. And then a neighborhood consists of all points that if I connect them to the space point, they have to pass through this point that I fixed on the geodesic. Right? And that creates at Right, right. So this this distance doesn't matter. This is irrelevant. And it's just for this convert only it's, it's relevant where it meets psi. Okay. And actually um, we can even write down a metric or lots of metrics. So pick a base point in the tree and then uh, if I have two points, they may or may not be on the boundary. I connect them both to my base point, and then I'm interested in this length. Let me make clear that that's an L and not an E. Okay, and the longer this is, the closer the points are together with respect to V0. So E to the minus L would be a metric on this space. And that's, of course, a very, I mean, if I restrict it to T, it's, of course, a very different metric from the one uh, we'll use this for the isometric actions, right? Okay, but so the space uh, is metrizable. All right. And then uh, the theorem I want to discuss is that now using this space, we can find such almost equivalent maps in this sense. So for any epsilon we go to zero and any finite subset in our group uh, we find a map from this compact space to our classifying space and here we end up in the actually let me um, Let me be a little careful. So <laughs> we end up in some finite subskeleton um, such that uh, this happens. So for all x in t bar, if I look at uh, what happens if I first apply f and then g, or f uh, first g and then f, I want this to be less than epsilon for all g in this finite subset. Okay, so that's just a reformulation of the existence of such a sequence. Okay, and uh, to make my life easier, uh, let's only discuss the restriction of F to the boundary. Okay, I'll only dis dis construct a map on the boundary, but then it's not too difficult to extend it to the interior because on the interior, T itself, right, is the classifying space for, I mean, is EG, right? So T itself, I mean, it already has a map to there, right? And then I just have to marry it to, to the map on the boundary and have to do some, you know, to pass from one map to the other. That's not a difficult thing to do. So really, the, the interesting part is, is how to construct the map on the boundary, right? Because the, this, yeah? So this, on T itself, right, the map I deserve, right, on T itself, we can, we can even pick an equivalent map, right? T, yeah, T is a, a G, some, a free G, some place comp, that's not a problem, right? But, but, uh, we have to do then something to sort of phase one map to the other to, to make it continuous. But that's not the difficult part. The difficult part is to construct a map on the boundary, because this is where all the isotropy is. This is where, uh, the action gets wild, whereas in the interior, it's simple. Okay. <laughs> And in the proof, you will see sort of uh, still the, the basic strategy that Farron Jones introduced at the very beginning when they proved uh, that the Whitehead group of 
negatively curved manifolds, uh, fundamental groups of negatively curved manifolds vanishes. Uh, and this proof used the dynamics of the geodesic flow on these manifolds. And we'll do a, a more combinatorial version of the same thing on this space T that in some sense is even more negatively curved than, than a negative manifold. I mean, you cannot be more negatively curved than, than being a tree. Okay, so we're we'll, uh, going to need a substitute for the geodesic flow. And there's an easy thing we can define. So uh, my flow space consists of triples, where x plus minus is a point uh, on t or its boundary. Oh, I should have. Uh, it's going to make my life easier if I restrict on the inside uh, every now and then to the vertices to get a discrete set uh, and not to t. So v will be a vertex. And we require that v is on the geodesic between x minus and x plus. Okay, So in particular, x minus has to be different from x plus if it is at infinity, because then there, there are no vertices between them. Okay. Um, and on this space, we have a flow. But then it's, it's naturally, it's, of course, a subspace of, of this. Um, actually, um, let me even make this even here. X plus minus. I'm only going to allow, it could be on the boundary, but on the inside. I'm only going to allow vertices. Okay, so we're in here, and then it's a zero dimensional space. I mean, it still has interesting topology because we added this boundary, but then it's uh, an easier space. Okay, so we can flow. Oops, phi tai phi t, sorry, of such a triple is just defined by we leave the start point and the end point alone and pick v prime. So this is x minus x plus. I just pick v prime here, where this distance is t. Right? If t is positive, and if t is negative, then I go, go the other way. OK? And, and if you're, you pay close attention, then you realize that's not quite defined if x minus is too close to v or x plus is too close to v, because we would try to have to push over it. And there are ways to deal with this, but I'm just going to ignore it. So um, we're just going to assume, assume here that uh, the distance from x plus minus to v is large, right? bigger than t. Otherwise, uh, we don't have a definition. But when we apply this, flow, we'll always We'll always be able to get into a situation where it's really only important in the case where these two points are far from v. Okay. Um. Okay. 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 And now, so the the I mean the role the flow space plays is kind of it comes between uh, t bar and the classifying space. So one first maps into the flow space. Because the flow space, I mean, it has sort of two, uh, two flavors of directions to it, namely directions in, in the direction of the flow, and directions transverse. So we move these x minus and x plus. Okay, and so I want to formalize a notion that allows to move those points just a little bit, but maybe move the v by a bounded amount. Okay, so that's sort of a weakening of something of the distance of two points being less than epsilon is. They're supposed to be epsilon in the transverse direction, but going with the flow is kind of cheap, so we, we allow that for some bounded amount of time. Okay, so, and that's uh, often called the foliated distance. So I'm going to write foliated distance between.
two points in the flow space is less than, and now it has two parameters, right? So it's just, I mean, it's just, just the whole symbol is what's being defined. Um, and so we say this happens if there is S and T such that phi T X minus V X plus might well only change the middle coordinate and phi S is we apply to the other point and it's supposed to give us the same middle coordinate and uh, the other have to stay fixed. And we're only going to allow, allow this for a bounded amount of time. So right, the, the, the amount of flow we, we allow ourselves is just the alpha. And then after we do this, uh, we want x minus to be close to y minus with respect to the metric we're given by v0. Okay, so d uh, v0 of x plus minus to y plus minus is supposed to be less than epsilon. Okay, but this can be made very, can I write it wrong? Yeah, um, very concrete in the picture. So what we're really asking is, so I have one point like this, and the other point could be this point. Okay, and we're, we're saying, okay, so this distance, this should be bounded by our alpha, and then this distance, so somewhere here is going to be the v0 we pick, and then this bit distance, these two are supposed to be large, right? Because the distance between those two points with respect to v0 are, are supposed to be large. So this is something like uh, bigger than ln epsilon. I guess minus. In any event, right? So the, the picture is just, if we write this, then it means we have this picture, right? The two points are bounded distance apart, and x minus and y minus are in the di same direction, going from here and actually very far. It's, it's very far, we have to go very far until we can distinguish them, and on the other side the same. Okay. Uh, you have a vertex in the finite part? You, you, this here or there? Which picture are you looking at? This picture? You can define the distance between two points. On the right, right. Well, right, it, it even works if we're not at the boundary. Right, so tick, pick two points, and we're going to define the distance relative to a fixed base point. Okay? Okay, and uh, the distance is... Uh, so pick this base point and connect him, connect the two points you have to this base point. You can do this if whether or not they're finite. Okay, and then measure how long it takes for, for the two geodesics to diverge, right? Because we're in a tree, we'll always get this picture if we connect three points. It will always be this tripod. Right, it, 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 it's not related to them being on the boundary. It's just, yeah. But it's a very different, right? If, if we do this on T, it's a very different metric than the one we had on T, right? It just sort of says, yeah. I mean, how, how right, if I look from V, how, how sharp do I have to look to actually distinguish them? If I look from B0 here. Okay.
Okay, so now the proof uh, of the theorem that I just erased uh, can be split up into two statements, right? I mean, the, the general idea was we want to go from, well, we're only talking about the boundary, we want to go to uh, the classifying space, and since I restrict to the boundary, I think now I can write two. Um, and we're going to construct this maps in two steps. I'm first going to map to the flow space and then to the space. Okay. And what the map to the flow space is supposed to accomplish is so for any G finite, there is an epsilon depending on S, what else, such that whatever small number we pick, uh, we find the map. F1 to the flow space uh, that has the property that it has this almost equivalence property if we use this, this foliated distance. So, uh, so this is supposed to be less than alpha. I mean, we can't we're not making much progress on alpha. Alpha just depends on S. But in the transverse direction, we can get whatever we want. Okay, so this is for all uh, all G in S and all Psi on the boundary. Okay, so that's the... Uh, the okay, let me try to say it again because this... I mean, think... Okay. Uh, for, forget for a minute the, the tree. Think of a manifold and a flow on the manifold, right? And then you can move, say it's a, uh, say it's a, um, a Riemannian manifold. But you can move with the flow, or you can move orthogonal to the flow. And that's what I think of as the transverse direction. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's you already know. Okay, good. So, and in, in this example, right, so, uh, so let's just forget V and W here. Just let's, let's consider the point X minus V zero X plus and v0 x y minus and y plus, right? Then I think of moving from one point to the other as only moving in the transverse direction. I didn't change this point, so I only move this to this, and I think of this as not moving much because it was very far from my v0. That's what I think of that, right? Right, right, I mean, if this gets large, then the epsilon gets small. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, the first half, right? So this, the, the, the first half sort of solves all the problems, or more correctly, pushes the whole problem into one direction, right? There's only one direction where it, it, where it fails, right? Namely the direction of the flow. Everything else is under control. And then uh, the second part deals uh, with this other direction. And I hope I get the quantifiers right. Right, okay, we're thinking of, we're, we're getting this input, in particular we're getting the alpha. We want to go somewhere, namely to epsilon, so whatever we're given, we can do something, provided we had the correct uh, delta. But since proposition one gives us any delta we like, that doesn't matter. Uh, and then there is uh, a map. defined on the flow space to uh, the classifying space and then the two skeleton such that first of all this is now is an actual G map all right so it doesn't screw up I mean uh, right, uh, applying F2 now this commutes directly with the G doesn't add anything to this problem and it makes this estimate better so if the foliated distance between two points that I'm now writing short uh, by calling them C and C prime, but these are points in the flow space, so these are triples. Uh, if they satisfied this estimate before, then after apply uh, 
after I apply the map. They're close together. Okay. Um, right. I mean, you have to sort through the quantifier a little bit, but it's it's really straightforward. If you're given these two, you get the theorem we want it. Right. I mean, unless I. Right. Right. Th right. Th so this one, right, this one is a G map, right, and that's important. Otherwise, we had we would have to control how much it adds if we want to compute G with the F two, but we don't, so we only have to worry about this one. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, proposition one, we can write down directly what we're supposed to do. Uh, so we have a point on the boundary. I need to tell you what do I do with it. So oh. So we fix uh, just some some base point, and we're going to take this as our initial point. And we're going to at the end we're going to pick the point on the boundary we're giving, and then we pick some point in between where we take him far from uh, v zero. Okay, so the picture is. I have v0 here, I have my geodesic to psi, and I pick v here, and I make this large, right? And the larger I make it, the better my map is going to be. Okay, so let's compare, uh, or maybe I try to do this with color. So let's try to compare f1 g psi to g f1 psi, right? So if I, let's do the yellow first. If I do apply g after the map, then I just apply uh, g to this picture everywhere. So I have g v0, I have g psi, and the point I'm putting here is the one of distance, whatever this big distance is, okay? So this distance c we picked, okay? And if I do it the other way around, then uh, I still replace psi by g psi, but then I start moving, starting from v naught. Right, so I start moving from v naught, and I connect it to g psi as well. Okay, but now g is from a finite set. Right, so the distance from v naught to g v naught—that's really a, a, a bounded thing. That's we, right. We, this, this, this gives us some number alpha. Okay, so we just have to move much further out. Right, to here. And now we see the, the foliar distance between, oh right, sorry, I um, didn't quite, I, so let's see, let's draw the red one, maybe it could be here. Right, I mean, those two points don't need to have the same distance from the point where the two geodesics meet. And this means, means the corresponding point in red will be somewhere else on the geodesic. But we can make this here. Right. As large as we want by just moving the v out, right? And we just make, need to make it larger than the distance between v naught and g v naught, right? And then we'll exactly have this picture. We even have it better. We didn't need uh, right? Th those two endpoints are the same, and the initial points are different, but they're far from where we are with our base point in the flow space. Okay? And the distance, sorry, and here this distance, right? This is bounded by alpha, which is the max of the distance in T between V0 and G V0, right? Because we moved them both the same amount of time from, from their base points. Okay, so um, one, we can write down the proof directly, okay? And I want to point out, so we used, we used negative curvature here. This is what negative curvature does for you. If you have two points at bounded distance and you're looking at the same point far away, and the geodesic suggests will quickly converge and be close together. In this case, it's very extreme. They become the same soon, right? In, in general, they will on, only be close together. Okay, um, and uh, we proved slightly more, so I'm gonna make um, a little uh, adjustment. 
Um, sorry, yeah? Right, right. So, but, but I, mean, I make this. I mean, I make this this choice. I make uniform, right? I should have written. So let's say this is f of c, and then I make this to be the distance c. Oh, okay. Okay. And then for c, now pick c to depend on s and epsilon, it's the correct one, and then it will work. Right, 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 right. So it's it's yeah. <laughs> Yes, so we, 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 yes. we can do this for every C, and if C is large enough, then the, the map has the required properties. Okay, so I wanted to um, uh, make a little adjustment to uh, the proposition. So I'm going to define the flow space bigger or equal beta as those triples. Uh, this was an X. Where the distance from x plus minus two v naught is bigger than beta, right? So this is exactly the part where it can flow for time uh, up to beta, right? Because I, I took the points out, and right, and if we look at our definition, we can make this distance by choosing c big enough as large as we want. So really, we can also say for all da 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 such that for all beta, the map ends up in this subspace. Okay, so we can put bigger equal to beta here, and then in proposition two, I only have to define the map on on the subspace, where I said bigger equal beta, and now uh, I can get to choose beta, so maybe um, Right, so so maybe proposition two only works on a subspace where beta is really large, okay? But it still works the same way out, and it's just a little thing uh, that, in order for me to avoid talking about the geodesics that are short, where I would have to do something slightly different. Okay, so it's not, it's just a technicality. Okay, so proposition one, we get right out of negative curvature. And for proposition two, we have to do something. All right, so proposition one gives, I mean, the map in proposition one is a very canonical map. And the one in proposition two isn't quite so canonical. Okay, so in here it's important to note that um, if you have a map from some space to a simplicial complex, that gives that gives you uh, a covering, an, an open cover of your space, because every simplicial complex kind of gives you canon and canonical open cover by open uh, stars around vertices and and so on, right? And you can pull pull this back to uh, to your space, but this cover almost remembers the map. Right, because it, it says anything that's mapped close to, say, this, this vertex over here needs to be in the pre-image of this open star and so on, right? So, so you can translate the existence of a map uh, into the existence of a certain cover on the space. And that's what I'm going to do next. Okay, so. Proposition two prime is, and the, Numbers change around, so what I was called, I guess, alpha over here, I'm going to call R in two prime because you know they can be computed from each other, but they're different. And similar for delta, I'm going to call eta, um, and the beta, we're not going to change. So, and now instead of a map, we say there is a cover U of the flow space such that. Okay, the first one is we want to end up in the correct dimension. So the cover, the dimension of the cover 
What did I say? Did I say two? Pardon? Yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking why did I say two, but okay, it doesn't matter. Um, the dimension of the cover. Oh, right, I remember. It's less than two. That's what it is. Um, and okay, and so okay, l l let's revisit this. What I talked about. So we have a we map from some space to a simplicial complex. On the simplicial complex, we have this canonical open cover. We can pull it back. Okay. So we're interested basically in a map that's contracting. Right. It should put things together. Right. That's what's supposed to be happening in proposition two. We want this alpha to become an epsilon. Okay. So uh, forget for a, a minute about this foliage business. Just think of you have a metric space and you want to have a contracting map to some simplicial complex. Okay. That's the same thing as having an open cover uh, that has a large Lebesgue number. Right. Every, every open set needs to be large because then everything in this open set is going to map kind of close to the corresponding vertex on the other side. Okay. So this is what we're going to do here. Only that uh, we remember we don't have to collapse everything. We just have to collapse this one direction. Okay. So this translates into the Lebesgue number being large only in the flow direction. So technically it reads as follows. If I have any point uh, in this part of the flow space, then I find a member of my cover such that if the foliated distance to this point is less than R and transverse, we have to allow some eta. Well, we can allow some eta, uh, but right, that's given to us by the theorem. So it, it's very, going to be very small. Such that this ends up all in U. Okay? But that's going to have the effect that the map, that this, this map construction to the nerve is going to be contracting in the direction of the flow. Okay. And now we also need to con make sure that the nerve of this cover, uh, qualifies as, as our target or maps to our target. So for this, I need U to be G invariant, right? That's going to force my map to be G invariant. So meaning if I have a, a member of my cover and a group element, then if I translate the member of the cover by G, I, I'm still a member of the cover. And, right? So then now, now we can take, uh, the nerve of this cover, right? Which has uh, vertices, exactly the open subsets and simplices. So n open subsets span a simplex if if there is a point in the intersection of these subsets, um, and then uh, what did I say? Right, and the, the dimension of the nerve is exactly this dimension here, so it's less than two by by our assertion. So that's good, but we also need to make sure that we get the right sort of isotropy, and this we can formulate as follows: right, if I have u, then um, I look at all the group elements that do not move u of u. So sorry. What well, is this? Uh, not empty, right? So we get some intersection. Uh, so this should just be the virtual cyclic group. Okay. And that introduces uh, virtual cyclic isotropy on the nerve of u. Right, so we'll, we'll only get to something that's close to, to this target here. Okay, so, um, that's, uh, proposition two prime. And now I want to, uh, briefly discuss how this is proved. And I'm going to do this, uh, in a, uh, let's think about this for a minute. So let's look at, so the, the space on which we want to define this map. Right? It, it is this flow space. It has all these flow lines, and, uh, and on a flow line, something is supposed to happen. Right? So let's just, uh, for a minute, think about just one flow line. Right? What would we need to do? We would need to produce a cover on, on the flow line that has very large Lebesgue number. That's what we say in number two, and its dimension shouldn't be too big. And then we need to take care of the group action, but we don't really see this on, on just one flow line. Okay? So let me give you a, a proof of the following uh, silly fact, or I mean, yeah, let's see. So if I have any number 
Then I find a cover U for the integers, right? That might be a flow line, it's an infinite flow line, uh, such that everything we want happens. So the diameter of U is less than something. I'm going to pick 6R. Uh, 2, the Lebesgue number uh, is larger than the constant we were given in the beginning. And to make it non-trivial, right, I mean, in this case, I could just say, okay, take, take the whole set. Okay, so to avoid this, we're going to act that the diameter of the sets in U are all bounded by 2R. Okay, uh, so if you think about this for a minute, um, oh, dimension, sorry, I, this is nonsense. So the dimension, I messed up the order, is 2 and the diameter is 6R. Okay, so if you think about this for a minute, you could prove this much better. You could prove this with the dimension being 1, right? Because that's the asymptotic dimension of Z, and you could just write down a cover by hand, okay? But what you would do is you would actually put down numbers and, and say, okay, I'm going to take right, the interval from 0 to 10, and then, uh, and then so on. And the problem uh, in the slow space business is that we don't have sort of universal coordinates on our flow lines. Right? Because the group action keeps moving them around. Okay, so we need a proof of this lemma that doesn't start with having a coordinate. Okay, and this can be done as follows. So, so we pack our set Z with disjoint balls of radius. R, right? So I get a collection of balls V R V V and V, right? For some set subset V of Z, and pack means I want it to be maximal, right? I mean, if I could add one, I would add one, right? So every other ball will have intersection with the balls we already have, uh, and then. For you, we're just going to use the same balls made bigger by a factor of three. No, no, there's no, sorry, there's no group in the lemma. That, I should have stressed it. So Z is just, it's just a flow line, and we're not thinking of an action. Uh, if we had an action on them, we would be in trouble. Let's just think about a flow line and no action. And I mean, so, I mean, okay, so you're right. There are uh, sort of, there are two kinds of flow lines in here, right? They're the ones that are not preserved by some group elements, and they're the ones where some subgroup of, of our free group is going to act on the flow line. And at the moment, we're only thinking about the ones uh, when nobody acts. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I, I hope I am reliable at the moment. Uh, right. Right. So, so in this case, so we were, right. But but, the, but even if, we, but even we're, if we're in this case, we we don't have a coordinate, right? So I want an argument that 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 doesn't go by writing down the cover, and then I don't know how it changes if I move from one flow line to the next. So I'm going to uh, put down an, an algorithm, kind of. OK. Okay, so let's briefly discuss why uh, 
this has the required properties. So uh, one, oh no, I, I messed up there. So three is obvious by construction, right? Everything is a ball of radius 3r, so it's diameter 6r. Uh, two, um, two is about the Lebesgue number. So note that our set is going to be contained in the union of our balls of radius 2r, right? Because if not, right, if, um, if I had a point, uh, some say z, such that the distance to any other v would be bigger than, strictly bigger than 2r, uh, then I could take the ball of radius r around n. It wouldn't meet the ball of radius r around v, so I could add this ball to my collection, okay? So that's why we have this. And then, of course, I mean, if the two r balls cover, then the three r balls have the back number at least r, because we made this bigger by r, right? Okay. Okay, and three, uh, one. Right. So one. Um, so let's again pick a point n. And we're wondering uh, in w how many of the uh, three r balls is he, okay? Okay, so. Uh, if I am in the 3R ball, then the distance from N to the corresponding center is less than 3R, right? So we're looking at an interval from V plus 3R to V minus 3R, right? All the centers of balls that are relevant are going to be in this interval. And the other n is not contained. Okay, but now there cannot be too many because the distance between uh, these two points needs to be at least two uh, r, right? Because the r balls around those have to be disjoint. Okay, and then then it's an easy. Now you calculate and see that it works with two. Okay. And now. And I want to at least outline uh, how this idea trans translates to proposition two prime. So we need to pack the flow space for the appropriate alpha uh, uh, beta. Okay, with sets of the following form. So we're going to use balls in the in the flow direction, and then we need to say what we do in the transverse direction. So um, we pick the base point, right, the center for the ball in the flow space, and okay, we need we want the points v minus and v plus to be far from v, but we also want them, that's why they're called v, to be vertices, to be finite points, okay? And then b, depending on this choice, is the set of all x minus w x plus, such that the following picture happens. So, uh, what is m y? Okay. X minus two x plus, and somewhere here I have w, and relative to uh, those points, w shouldn't be too far from v, and x minus and x plus should be behind v minus and v plus, looking from here. Okay, so, uh, right, so the transverse, uh, transverse distance is very small because we're very far from here, and the direction in the flow is bounded by r, right, by the, the number we're interested in. Okay. Okay, now 
so now we, we pack with this and now we can proceed as in the lemma. Um, right, by thickening, right, by just changing uh, this parameter. So this is kind of an, a transverse R ball around X minus W. Uh, sorry, V minus V, V plus, and then we change the R as we did in the other argument. Okay, um, okay, that sounds good. It doesn't quite work because uh, we need to do this equivariantly. Right? After all, we wanted an equivariant cover of this thing. And, okay, so we, we can just say, okay, we pick a maximal equivariant cover of, of this thing. But then, then we won't get to everywhere because, because of the isotropy. So we'll have to allow some intersections in this packing on orbits of the same U, right? If I move U by a group element, I need to allow intersections sometimes, but I will only need to allow this, uh, for subgroups that are cyclic. Okay, so it, so this way, in the end, the cover we produce this way uh, will have isotropy as in four, but no more. And I think I'll spare you the details and stop here. Right. I mean, there, there are some changes you need to do, but it basically the proof for abolic groups is not, not all that much different. Uh, the, the main difference is then you work, say, on the Cayley graph of the hyperbolic group, and geodesics are no longer unique, and you have to worry about this a little bit, but uh, in the end it doesn't matter.